I want to do everything I can to, to make people more aware of what the services that Habitat has to offer. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Zarek Samples. And uh, he's, uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his background in just a second, but he is a Savannah area local, not exactly a Savannah local, but <laughs> uh, closer than me. And uh, he's the CEO of the local Habitat for Humanity. Absolutely. Thank you, Tyler, so much for allowing me to be on the show today. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit, because uh, I only gave like the basic, basic introduction. Like, where are you from? What's your background? Okay. What do you do day to day? That kind of thing. So I am from Brunswick, Georgia, which is about an hour south of Savannah. Um, day to day, I love to love people. Um, it's my my complete passion. It's just a, being able to be um, some type of help to somebody else. Call um, to serve. Absolutely, I do feel like I'm called to serve, and you see, you'll find that in every area of my life. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in detail. Um, day to day, I am the chief executive officer for the Coastal Empire Habitat for Humanity, located at uh, seven zero one Martin Luther King Boulevard. And uh, we are so excited that we have an opportunity to begin building in the city of Savannah post COVID. So we're looking for all of our volunteers to come back out. We have three beautiful properties in West Savannah. Um, and then we're going to go back to Garden City and start s s additional bills. So it's cool. going to be great. Cool. And so how long have you been with uh, Habitat for Humanity? I started with Habitat in September of 2020. Um, I had previously served in Brunswick, Georgia at Coastal Georgia Community Action, which is a private nonprofit that moves families towards self-sufficiency. We served individuals from the cradle to the grave, literally. We started with our pregnant moms um, who were with child. And then once that child was six weeks old, they can come into our program. And then we also served individuals who were of citizen, senior citizen age in our um, senior citizen program in McIntosh County. We served nine counties along the coast. So it's fun. I've never been introduced as almost like a son of Savannah. But, but what you said earlier, of the coastal Georgia area, I've always served the coastal Georgia area. So from Tattle County all the way down to Camden County, I've been well, trying to serve people. Here's the thing about being a Savannah local. Okay. If you're from Richmond Hill, you're a local until you meet somebody from Savannah proper. Oh, okay. And then they say, oh, no, you're from Tybee. And then it's really like, and then it's like, oh, I've been here my whole life. Well, your parents aren't from here. And then, so you're not, you're not actually a Savannian. And then they go, the people, oh, your, uh, your parents are from here. My great granddaddy is from Savannah. So it's really, it's kind of like this, uh, pissing match right, <laughs> whose right. family's been here the longest one up somebody else huh? yeah exactly and so you know some people and pe when I ask people I'm like are you from Savannah well I've been here for 25 years <laughs> but they don't want to claim it because they know that somebody else is going to be like I've been here for 35 yeah. years I've been here my whole life or you know that's crazy man <laughs> that funny. means people really do love Savannah Oh you yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's yeah. just something about the charm of the city, and that we are truly the hostess city of the south. <sighs> That's part. You know, we we're trying to figure out how to put that into words. You know, with, with through visit uh, my work with Visit Savannah and just talking to other uh, other guests on the show. It's like there's something about Savannah. It's hard to really like put a finger on it. I think part of it is like just how welcoming you know the the hospitality culture, but like just different people from different walks of life. And then we kind of like defy some expectations that people might have. But you, I remember from our conversation the other day, you you ended up going to school in Savannah. I did. Yeah, I so did. What, 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 what's the story there? What'd you I, mean? um, <laughs> backstory, I'm from Brunswick and my mom told me, she said, Zarek, where are you going to college? And I said, I don't know, I'm going to school for healthcare. Um, I want to become a registered nurse. I feel like I would be a, tra a wonderful traveler nurse. I had previously obtained my certification as a nursing assistant um, in high school. And I started down at the community college. My mom said, you can go within an hour radius just in case I need to get to you. And so it was like she okayed Valdosta, um, but 
talking about my creative side, I actually almost got some scholarships to do choral at Armstrong at Lake State University. And so I toured the campus, had done um, a few performances in the Fine Arts Auditorium, and fell in love with the college um, as I completed my um, my high school career. So when I found out they had a nursing program, I was like, bet, this is it for me. It's an hour away from Brunswick, and so I would love to attend Armstrong. Uh, I met uh, Bill Kelso my first day of driving on to the campus, and he is. I learned he was too from um, Brunswick, Georgia, uh, or had come through Brunswick, Georgia, a part of his life or what have you. And I've been a champion of Armstrong, now Georgia Southern, um, since then. I uh, fell in love with the campus. Uh, again, I had an opportunity to sing with the Gospel Choir, the Anointed Voices Gospel Choir. Uh, was a part of the NAACP was a part of the Student Government Association Campus Union Board, got to meet and really understand who Dr. Blyken, Linda Blyken was on an in-depth level, um, and just so enjoyed just being a part of that culture. Um, I grew up in a very diverse community, and I understand that um, I have very much, I have a lot of pride in who I am and my nationality, but it's the it's the camaraderie, it's the uniqueness of, of living in the beloved community, meaning that there are different races, um, different uh, orientations that individuals have that make us who we are as, as a unit. And so um, I think Armstrong was definitely that college that uh, just took it to ne- another level. We had over uh, 89 countries represented at Armstrong Lake State University. We were Arboretum, so we learned about all of the different cultures um, and all of the different areas in which uh, vegetation grew. Um, and we were very inclusive as it pertained to culture. Uh, many of you may or may not know Melanie Rodriguez, but she was over the Ola program. And we got an in-depth look of what the uh, Hispanic culture was like. And so that was those are all the beautiful things that um, that kept me at Savannah, I mean, kept me at um, in Savannah at, at Armstrong. And so I obtained my master's, I obtained my undergrad, which was uh, health science, and then I went back for a master's in adult education. And people say, how do those two mix together? Well, my um, undergrad is a bachelor's of science in community uh, health, because at that point I said, I'm still gonna be in health. Um, I'll just be a health educator. And then um, I was like, well, I really don't know what I want to do just yet. And I got an offer to come back to school to get my master's in adult education and community leadership. And um, Dr. Holt was my my lead professor and advisor. And that lady just put me, she just, she just, she gassed me up so much. She felt like I, I, got, I could be whatever I wanted to be. Um, she encouraged me to be on the um she and Cheryl, I forgot what Cheryl's last name is. Cheryl works in the alumni affairs at the time. They uh, advised me to be on the alumni association board mm-hmm. and I worked my way up to vice president um, before they did the merger to Georgia Southern and uh, Armstrong. Um, and all, doing, all, th- all throughout that time, I just continued to fall in love with the university. Um, and even so, when I moved back to Brunswick, I, um, I still was associated with the with the with the alumni association, and did everything I could for the campus, whether they be in Brunswick or Hinesville at that campus, or I actually came back to Savannah. So, uh, again, fell in love with the city, and uh, started my career. My first full time career was with the YMCA of Coastal Georgia, under Mr. Randy Bugis, who gave me a wonderful opportunity to become the executive director for the McIntosh County branch. Did you consciously decide to not go into healthcare or healthcare education? Or I guess the YMCA kind of falls under that umbrella a little bit? It 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 did, but it's almost like it's just a God thing. Like he knows your path far beyond before you know it. And um it just kinda kinda fell in my lap type situation. And I think that's a very unique thing. I've never had a job that I really had to apply for. Um it's always been like, Hey Zarek, you ought to do this. Hey Zarek, why don't you think uh, why don't you apply here? And so um, I just have allowed the Lord to just lead me in every in the path that I'm at, where in, in the path that I'm taking now. How do you get? How do you prevent getting pulled in too many directions? Whew. I'm still learning. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, I just made some hard decisions this this particular week about you know some long term commitments that I had uh, back in Brunswick, and um, one of the things that you have to learn to prioritize, you have to figure out what. What is your purpose in this season? Sometimes we get stuck on uh, being the lead or the head or being involved for an extensive period of time. And you have to really kind of 
do like some just some, some homework on yourself and figure out, you know, what should my priorities be at this moment in time? And uh, I, all of my close friends and relatives will tell you that I'm 100 places all the time doing 100 different things. And so, like I said, I'm still learning that portion of it. So when I say, hey, come on my podcast, you're like, all right, I'll be there. <laughs> I got exactly. 14 other places to be, but well, I appreciate it. Absolutely. No, thank you for this opportunity. I wrote this down, purpose in this season. I think one thing we talk about a lot on The Creative Truth is um, kind of finding your call and figuring out what it is you want to do. Um, and when I was younger, I kind of thought that would be like an end goal or like a, a place that I could achieve. But really what I've discovered is that like, here's what I'm working on at this point in my life and 10 years down the road that could change, you know? So I like that you're, you're focused on in this season of my life, you know, here's what my purpose is. And then down the road, what are some things that you maybe thought you would do when you were 18? Uh, I thought I would be traveling the world for a profession. I thought that I would be in a different beautiful destinations um, providing health care. Um, but what I've learned is, is that it's not necessarily about where you end, it's how you handle the journey. So when I'm talking about being being pur- purposeful, being, well, how do I want to say that? Being mindful of what your purpose is in this particular season, um, as, a, at a, as a young adult, sometimes we get so focused on being the head of an organization or we get so focused on uh, being the top of the class or whatever it is. Or even picking your major. Or picking your major. Your Listen, major. You're this is the rest of your life. <laughs> exactly. No. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at it, some people say, well, Zero, you're not using either one of your gr- degrees. But I'm actually using both of them, but just different parts of it, if that makes sense. Um, I've learned to embrace where I'm at. Um, it's, it's really hard to put into words what it is, but it's like literally allowing yourself to be freed of uh, where you should be at in life, the statuses you should have, the houses, the cars, um, the, the money that you're bringing in and just living in that moment. Um, when you allow yourself to do that, you take a lot of the pressure that society puts on you. Um, and so it allows you to be truly free. And I, I tell you, one of the opportunities I had, I'm in 20, must have been 2018. And I, and I, I took one month and said, I'm going to stop trying to put all these mandates on myself. Mm. And it was so funny because the minute I did that, I was free to go back to one of my first love, which is art and theater. And so uh, in the month of February of 2018, um, uh, there was a uh, uh, middle-aged woman um, who came to my church. I sing praise and worship at my church in Brunswick, Georgia. And she came to my church and she said, oh, my God, you have a beautiful voice. And I was like, well, to God be the glory for the things that he's done. You know, that's, a, that's what us, us Christian people do. Uh, and so uh, she came and she said, I would love for you to sing with me. I'm doing some community theater um, on St. Simon's Island and I'd love for you to be a part. And I was like, I don't know if I have the time commitment. You know, it's just too much to handle, blase, blase. And so before long, she convinced me. And I had the time of my life. We redid Smokey Joe Cafe. Um, and she heard my voice and she gave me a few lead parts. I was able to sing uh, a, a Rose in Spanish Harlem, knew nothing about it. Um, the Neighborhood song. There were so many different things that I had not, that I forgot that I did in high school. And and was so focused on where I was going and what my direction was. It, I was able to be freed by some of the creative sides that I basically put in hibernation because I was so focused on where I would be at in life. And so it, it was a spinoff. Um, we did two months of this show, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, they asked for an encore for another week. And then in two years, we did it again and did Showstoppers and we did Dream Girls and we did um, uh, what, Jersey Boys. And uh, it was one other um, set that we did or what have you. And so it's like it's, it's music and it's uh, theater all wrapped into one. So as somebody who's a high achiever, um, but then took the time to do the creative elements of your life, how important is it to uh, have an outlet for creative expression? It is, it's it's definitely important. Um, You have to find the outlet for you. 
You know, some people say I, w- I want to just get on the couch and watch a movie or what have you. Some people say I want to lay out in the sun or whatever. For me, it was using the gifts that God's given me um, to just find my way to just release to to get into something that I, I absolutely love. Um, let's talk about uh, the early origins of that. You said your first love was music and theater. Um, how did that start? Uh, in kindergarten, I went to St. Simon's Elementary School. And we did um, uh, a drama called In the Jungle. And every class had a different song. And we were the cheetahs. We are party animals. We're going to paint the town or whatever. And uh, i never forget. My mama still has the v, uh, VCR <laughs> of it. And I was such a, I had so, so, much, so much of showmanship mm-hmm. that I was on the top of the, um, what are the things that you, um, Bleachers. The, not the bleachers. What do they use when you're singing in, in chorus and stuff like that? Risers. Something like a bleach. Risers. There yeah, we go. Yeah. So I jumped from the top riser down at the end of that song. And so <laughs> my mom always used to play that at home. My mom and my dad, they played it at home. It was like, you always just had to take it up a notch. And so um, all throughout elementary school, we um, middle school and high school, uh, I, I was just, I would just was a sing I was in. I, I we did uh, Mr. Bumble in high school. Um, I joined the step team in middle school or whatever. And there's different forms of art that just allow me to truly express who I am. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why I joined the fraternity I did on Make It Sci Fi because we are very express e- expressive people. Um, people know sometimes for how loud we are, but when you really get to to the soul of an Omega Man, uh, he is everything that I just described. He is the person who is the hardest lover. He, he goes the hardest. Um, he's the most expressive. Um, and he's going to let you know exactly how he feels when he feels it. I, uh, I jotted down that I thought it was a little funny that your mom said you can only go an hour away. Because <laughs> some people would not, you know, they'd be like, I got to get as far away as possible. <laughs> but uh, I am also like... I'm too far from my mom. I mm-hmm. miss her. I, I can I can I'm going I got to get home to see her pretty soon cuz like she's a big part of my life. For you, what's it like having that like support system? It's amazing. Um my mom or Where is, would you let, better question here. What where would you be if you didn't have that? Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. Um you know, at first I was like I I travel um, and I've, I've gone to different countries. I've gone to different city, different states. Um, and I love going there, but I also like coming back. Um, and I like being just close enough to be away, um, but close enough to be where if, if in arm reach. And t- to, to, to that point, um, I just purchased my first home. Oh, and my parents are hosting um, a um, housewarming on Saturday. Uh, at about 1.30 yesterday afternoon, I got a call from my mom. She said, turn off the alarm. And I said, "What for what? What's going on? What's at my house? She's like, we here. And I was like, here to do what? My mom and my dad came to bring tables and chairs um, to clean where I, you know, moms and dads, they know far much more uh, how to clean a bachelor pad than I, <laughs> than I do. So they were there last night until midnight, making sure that everything was right. Um, and that's the kind of community that we grew up in and the kind of community that I've tried to um, create for people who I see coming up underneath me. Um, mm-hmm. I've always been a part of different youth ministries or youth groups, whether it be uh, Cali Community Action Youth Leadership Initiative in Brunswick or you, uh, Teen Achievers from the YMCA. I've always been in, in, involved in youth groups because I want to pour back into people in the same way that uh, people have poured into me. And so, you know, my family is not just my parents. Like my mom is one of 12 siblings. And uh, how many is that? Three minus 12 is uh, eight, nine. So uh, nine of my aunts and uncles are still living. And before the pandemic, every third Sunday, all of us would get together. And so you have four and five generations of family um, that you know on a first name basis and and as opposed to you growing up as relatives or distant relatives we grew up as almost brothers and sisters you know I was I was talking to one of my um, cousins before I went to lunch today or whatever and just we just pick up like like it's like it's nothing hmm. um, let's let's step back a little bit and talk about Habitat okay I want to know kind of what your day to day is like 
Whew, okay. Well, Habitat is a ever-changing organization. Uh, I had no experience with Habitat or building houses or construction at all prior to taking this position. And it has definitely been a, a opportunity for me to jump in some roller skates and roll with the punches. Um, Habitat has been the organization who has really stretched me um, in the fact that I don't know what to expect, but I'm anticipating um, different moves from different people. I've had an opportunity to bring on some amazing new talent. Uh, we had a very strong team already in place, uh, and I'm so excited to be a part of, of what's going on here. But it, it could start with, I tell you what, one of the most funniest days I've ever seen in my life, but it showed me what real teamwork is. Um, as you know, Habitat for Humanity is right off of the main strip of MLK. It's at the corner of, of MLK and Gwinnett. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, um, as opposed to taking donations in right through our doors, what we did was we had a location in which uh, people can drop off their donations. Well, as we or were starting to move out of the, the phase of that, we strongly encourage individuals to bring donations in so we can make sure that you get all the tax credits that, uh, you know, the tax write offs or what have you. But there are still people who just drop things off, whether it be overnight um, or whether it be early that morning or what have you. And I never forget the first one of the first mornings that I pulled up to Habitat for Humanity. It looked as if someone took everything out of a house in plastic bags and dumped it at our door. And the funny thing is, people don't know that there's a door on the right side of the building where the administrative offices lead to or what have you. And so that's the office. That's the door we go in and out of. And literally you had like couches, but you had toothbrushes and you had clothes and you had shoes, dog bowls. Literally, they just put they put the entire house. I don't know if it was oh, an eviction man. or what was it, yeah. but they literally just dumped the entire the properties, in, internal properties of the house at our doors. That's, that doesn't they're not even trying to be helpful, but That's, I hadn't got to the best part. OK, someone had taken had come. It had to happen over that either later later the day before or late that night. And somebody came and opened every last one of those bags and pulled out, I guess, what they wanted or what have you and just left it out. So as I'm pulling up, um, my homeowner service manager, Jamie Walker and my accountant, Bill, um, were already trying to figure out how we're going to get into the building because, you know, it literally is like climbing through a sea of stuff to get to the door that we get in. And so we finally made it in and Bill said, I'll grab the gloves. And Jamie said, I got the bags. And literally Jamie is in heels and we're all dressed professionally. I have on a suit or what have you. Bill has on, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, business attire. And each one of those individuals rolled up their sleeves and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. Bill pulled around his truck. He said, we're going to throw this stuff on the truck or what have you, and we'll take it to the go. Because we don't take soft home goods. We, sure. we, we take appliances, couches, you know, things like that or whatever. Not clothes. And we don't, who's going to use another, another person's toothbrush? But we spent the first two hours of our day just picking up everything outside. And so, you know, some people would have said, well, that's not my job. But the people that we have working at Habitat truly believe in his mission and truly go above and beyond to make sure that the people who need our services get our services. So um, that was a long answer to the beginning of my day. But uh, it, it typically starts with um, uh, meeting with my uh, first answering emails, telephone calls. But then I go right into figuring out what are the different departments. Um, a lot of people think that Habitat for Humanity just gives houses away. But we actually uh, afford hardworking families, affordable home ownership. It's not a renting situation. Um, they don't, the houses are not given away by any stretch of the imagination. They pay the same taxes, the same escrow, um, the same down payment that you would pay. We just make it affordable. And the way we do that is we bring in volunteers. We solicit uh, donations from contractors, um, supplies, whatever it took to build the house. We try to do that and so that we can make the home affordable. Um, so I start by meeting with those individuals to see where we are with our families. Um, Habitat is uh, notorious for making sure that not only are you able to get the house, but you're able to keep the house. And I say that because there are homeowner education classes that we take our families through uh, for about a year, year and a half to make sure that they understand what their rights are, uh, what their limitations 
um, what they need to know once they finish dealing with habitat, um, municipality rules and regulations. But we also make sure that if if something happened to them, that they have a will. You know, a lot of times people will get houses or what have you and don't have it's not will to anybody. No one knows where it goes after that. And so then it goes into the hands of of the of the system uh, of the area. And so as opposed to that, we make sure that our homeowners are truly ready um, for home ownership at that point in time. So starts off with them. We work with the families um, and get them ready to become a uh, purchaser or uh, homeowners. Uh, we also have a construction team headed up by um, Hosea uh, Hannon. Uh, better known as Ruben, and he is our construction manager. He leads a wonderful team of volunteers. We have two sets of volunteers set on uh, Tuesday and set on Wednesday, and then we also offer other volunteer opportunities for people who say, listen, I have no experience, but I want to help. Mm-hmm. We have a space for you. We can help have you here on Tuesday or Wednesday or Saturday um, so that we can together build a home. Um, I also meet with my development director, Julie Swartz, she is new to the team and is a fireball um, of getting people connected to Habitat. And so uh, I can meet with any of those individuals or our restore manager, Jeremy, to figure out what sales look like, what are some of the things we're going to put on our social media. Um, And then we go into meeting with the boards and uh, the day just continues to roll. And then after five, (laughs) we could be going to business after hours or um, community meetings um, just to kind of keep engagement, keep to be engaged with the community. Yeah. How do you, how do you get the word out so people know that you're out there? Well, we start with this, this (laughs) podcast today. (laughs) Sorry, Uh, there we go. Uh, We start with uh, things like this today. Uh, One of the, one of our biggest things is word of mouth. Um, And we truly, have a great audience in Savannah who responds and responds very quickly. How could like just the everyday Savannian that, you know, just help out? I, I know you mentioned volunteering, like that's one way. Absolutely. Um, I guess, I guess how do people like, well, we'll, we'll get to the actual plugs at the end. Okay. But, uh, but uh, what other ways that do people, can people learn more and get involved? Absolutely. First, you can go to our website. It's www.habitatsavannah.org. Um, or they can contact us on Facebook, which is uh, Habitat Savannah, um, Instagram and Twitter at the same ha- Habitat Savannah. And um, Facebook, I appreciate all of our followers on Facebook are, are really booming. We uh, have been putting out some uh, fresh new media um, and people have they're, they're definitely responding, whether it be mm-hmm. to a mortgage burning ceremony we had at our at our, our restore. What's or, that? A mortgage burning? Yeah. Ceremony? So when you finish paying off your mortgage. It's time to retire that sucker. <laughs> so a civilization that you have completely finished with your entire mortgage, we set up like this cauldron and we give you your mortgage and say, it's all paid off and you have an opportunity to burn it in front of all your family and friends. It's like the Dave Ramsey debt-free scream. Exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. That's and so awesome. you know about Dave Ramsey. Oh, yeah. Guess what that's offered? Huh? Oh, Guess that's, what that's, that, that's, that's, that's oh, a part of our program at Habitat. Financial Peace University. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yeah, Financial Peace University is a eight to nine week program that we had we host for our family for our partner families. But um, coming in this coming fall, we're going to open it up to more individuals in Savannah, so that they can take part in that. Because it's not just about new home ownership, but it's sustaining your home. Yeah, long term. Yeah, sustaining your home. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, and Savannah has a lot of wonderful strengths. Savannah also has some things it needs to work on and y'all are kind of at the forefront of that. So anything I can do to help to get the word out there, I'm happy to be a part of it because I love Savannah. Absolutely. And I want to see it succeed long term. If I could just speak on that for just one yes, second. Yes, please. One of the analogies that I was given a, a while back was that when the tide rises, all boats should rise. But every now and then you'll find that there are boats who are weighted down or there are boats with holes in them. And so what we're trying to do is patch those holes and we're trying to free people of chains to keep them bound so that when the tide rises, all of Savannah, all of Chatham County will rise. Or as a wise man once said, give them the bootstraps to be able to pull up themselves. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so in the, uh, oh, how about Restore specifically? So yeah, that, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I've never seen, I, I've, I've you know given the habitat, but not no, not seen the whole picture of it, right? So individuals um, get ready to renovate or they're leaving the area or that it's just time to just change things up. And they come off and drop, they come by or we can go and pick up um, some nice 
goods, home goods, um, whether they be couches or um, nice desk. Um, so that's another land way fixtures. People, yeah, they can donate can yeah. um, their their things that they're getting rid of, and you, it's, it, I, I see it now to be so true that one man's trash can be another man's treasure. Um, I'm, I'm talking about some almost brand new couches that have walked in there, huge mirrors and tables galore that that are very that are very you know if you go to a regular market can be quite expensive. Sure. Um, but with just a, a little bit of loving, we can go in and dress it up or what have you and put it back on our floor. Um, individuals can can use it again in, in, a, in a different capacity. So it's a beautiful it's a beautiful change to see someone who say, I'm about to throw something away. It's simply as a door. If you get new doors or whatnot, and so I'm, I'm just I just want something different or whatever. And somebody come, comes in and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. You feel like you feel like you're, you're walking in your purpose because it's kind of like someone we were just talking about re- re- recycling a minute ago, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what somebody's looking for. I received a bag yesterday that was made out of completely of, of old plastic uh, bottles or whatnot. And to, to know that I'm in this circle or in this community that continues to, um, to what, what am I looking for? What's what I'm looking for? It's just like that circle of life that, you know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just well, Savannah is a community that values its history. I mean, there's a we have the what are they called the Savannah Historic Preservation Society. Absolutely. So you can't just buy a home and gut it and then make it however you want it. Right. You have to adhere to some of the historic ordinances, and there's like a cer- certificate of uh, appropriateness that you see plastered on buildings. Um, and in other in other cities, um, they'll uh, you know Walgreens. Not to name, not to like name name. Not that there's anything necessarily like. I'm not saying Walgreens is evil, but what yeah. they'll do is they'll buy a lot, they'll level it to nothing, and then they'll put a Walgreens up. Right. And Savannah, it's not possible. And um, so you're kind of in the right community for that. People value antiques, and they wonder the initials that are etched into the leg of the chair you know who was that person and there is kind of this legacy that's passed down through it's like part of savannah's culture a little bit and you know it's kind of unique because um even some of our film crews will come in and buy things from us because of the the age or the time in which it was built um i had one of my performer uh, faculty members from armstrong who constantly comes into the restore um he actually is a, a woodsman himself and he got a, a old bed frame and he said it looked kind of wonky or what have you but apparently he saw some type of uh insignia on it researched it and found that it was a bed that was built like the 1800s in england um and he put it on facebook and a crew you know savannah's very well known for um movies etc being mm-hmm. filmed here and someone actually used it for a war movie from that from that from that time period and so it's just the it's, it's it's huge to see your work kind of in 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 entwined with all of the different nuances in savannah uh in the next season where what do you see your purpose as being or becoming I don't know if I'm completely honest. I don't know, but I'm ready for it or whatever it is. Uh, I know that um, as I on board here at in, in Savannah and Habitat, I, I want to do everything I can to, to make people more aware of what the services that Habitat has to offer. And so um, over the next six months to a year, be ready because we're going to be calling on you and everyone in Savannah to, to learn and be a part of the story of Habitat. Mr. and Mrs. Fuller, when they founded Habitat, um, this affiliate started in 1983, they are really big on the community being the source of funds, resources, um, and talent that continues to refuel what happens at Habitat. And so uh, it's gonna take all of us, it's gonna truly take the village to help each and every one of the families we're working with. Yeah, we have a lot of um, really strong positive organizations in Savannah that, um, you know, as we continue to figure out how to work together more, 
Um, that, yeah, it's not going to be somebody coming from somewhere else to save us. We're going to build ourselves up and, and lift ourselves up as a whole. Um, do you think it's ever too late to decide to completely change up your career? At what point are you like, all right, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? No, I don't. I think that you get at any point in time when you feel a notion, um, very calculated notion, I will tell you. Um, uh, not you, an impulse. No, not an impulse. Not at all. I'm not an impulsive person. I try not to be. Um, but I believe that you should make calculated moves that fuel you. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, one of my classmates in my master's program was 63 years old when she went back to get her master's yeah, good for her. Um, in adult education. And so she said she just felt like it was time to change. And I think that was so pivotal for me because, you know, uh, our generation said, okay, at 55, I'm done and I'm going to live my life. Well, and, and looking at the aging population, you turn 55 and yeah, you've done your 30 years, et cetera, but then you're left with what to do. Your body's in this routine. Yeah, sit by the pool. Right. <laughs> yeah. Your body's in this routine of just, you know, you work day in and day out. Do I think you should take a break? Yes. Do I think you may not need to 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 work as hard as you have for the last 30 years? Yes. But you still need to be active. You still need to keep your mind sharp. You still need to stay fit, fit and fitness. Uh, you still need to uh, stay remain moving and 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 keep your, keep up with your fitness is what I'm trying to say. And so I feel like at at some point in time, I think my 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 career will change. To be honest with you. Uh, it'll probably be in something around ministry. Mm. Um, so I think when when God shows me everything he's meaning to show me right now, then we'll switch into ministry in some in some shape or form. So You're doing ministry in some shape or form already. That's true. <laughs> Do you see yourself doing more with uh, singing and, and theater? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Marianne, uh, what's Marianne's last name? Gana Papel allowed me an opportunity at one of her events to grab the mic and I was like I'm not about to sing and uh, so the piano player started playing and one of my favorite songs by John Legend um, he, he began to play and so I put up the lyrics because I of course I forgot the words uh -huh. and just it just it just all came back to me and uh, I look forward for more opportunities like that um, in Savannah where I can use the gift God's given me Beautiful. Um, well, I'm I'm super happy you came on. It was great to get to know you more, to hear about what y'all are doing. Um, one thing we always do at the end of each episode is, if you're oh, I before we get to that, okay. Do you feel the sense of guilt when you're not, you know, when you do you allow yourself to be lazy and watch? you know, movies or just veg out or scroll through Instagram? Or do you have this, like I do, this sense of like, I need to be going all the time? <laughs> I think you will find that the people who are closest to me feel like I never stop working. Um, because like I alluded to at the beginning, my purpose is to help people. And that comes in a variety of shape, forms, and fashions. And so, yes, I do feel guilty when I'm not working. I feel like there's something I could be doing. Um, that's something I could be learning. That's someone I could be helping. Um, but every now and then I will allow myself to just kind of veg out um, and just take a huge step back from my reality and just to live, live, truly live in the moment. And so that was um, a wonderful time, uh, those times that I have. Mm. Yeah, and that's where, you know, your creative outlets come in. I was just going to say, because sometimes, and it's, it's hard because when you allow your mind to relax, it's like those things that are way back here start just coming out. And it's like, yeah, remember this? Da, 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 da. And so like all these creative, I'm like, I need a pen. I need paper because I'm, I'm, I'm planning or ideas are coming that could help me in my, in my overall goal. Hmm. So, yeah. All right. Last question. Okay. We always ask people to give some advice to young people. So uh, Raz told me I should phrase this as a scenario and not a, not just a question here. And I got to work on this, but you're walking down the street okay. and you run into a younger version of yourself. Maybe the, maybe the version that is about to go to school for med for, to be, to become a nurse. Um, but you only have 30 seconds. What advice are you going to give your younger self? to live on purpose.
to embrace every opportunity that you're given to learn how to eat fish. Take the meat <laughs> and spit out the bones. Okay. Just that simple. Uh, I think that a lot of times, you I know, thought you meant literally. You didn't like fish back then. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Literally, learn how to uh, uh, the the metaphor of eating fish. Sure. Whereas the uh, fish is good. The, the meat of the fish is very good. But if you chew those bones, they're gonna hurt you in the long run. Whether mm-hmm. they hurt you right here in your general mouth area or your esophagus or your stomach in general. So learn how to eat the meat, eat the meat of the fish mm-hmm. and spit out the bones mm-hmm. because some things can harm you. And when you digest them, you mess yourself up. But live on purpose, and and live your truth. Ah, uh, we talk about that a lot. This podcast is called the Creative Truth, for that exact reason. Uh, we did this in the middle. Let's do it one more time. How can people, if y'all have, um, if you're moving, or if you're upgrading, or if you just have something that you're not sure what to do with it, and you could get. Uh, you know, a couple bucks on Facebook. Maybe it's worth actually bringing it back to the restore to uh, to give to uh, a community member that's in need. Um, you can also volunteer. How can people learn more about the Habitat for Humanity? Absolutely, they can reach us at Savannah at Habitat at HabitatSavannah.org, or they can call us at nine one two three five three eight one two two. Um, And we can get you in the right direction, whether it is to um, bring your time, your talent or your treasure. It could all be used at Habitat. Is there anywhere people can go to hear you sing? Yes. Every Sunday morning at Philadelphia, the Overcomer Church of Deliverance in Brunswick, Georgia. (laughs) But you you just never know. Um, I like the essence of surprise as well. So you just never know where you hear me sing. Okay, I support (laughs) it. Well, in... uh, In upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. If you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can reach me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. You can visit us at creative-truth.com to learn more. You can buy mugs, hats, sweatshirts, shirts, swag, uh, you know, onwards and upwards. This is going to be one of the last episodes in this podcast studio. We're actually moving to a larger space, so stay tuned. And uh, Zarek, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. We're going to have to do this again in the new studio. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. Let's do it a year from now. Let's see what I've learned and how I'll develop. Check back in with you. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening.